So I'm going to be presenting on the essay that I did for my uh, philosophy masters. Um, I'm still doing the masters, but I did this uh, last year in the first year um, about the prevalent co-occurrence of autism and gender diversity. Um, I won't be able to talk about all of the, the arguments in the essay, but um, I'll, I'll try and make it specifically relate to impact. So I think the um, this field of research um, and the issues surrounding it are really interesting example of how research that privileges marginalized voices, so in this case the voices of um, gender diverse and um, autistic individuals voices, um, research um, on that fails to have the impact that maybe it should. So um, that's kind of the, the argument that I'll sort of be making throughout this as well. Um, so just for a bit of background, um, the essay that I did sort of explored and evaluated three possible explanations as to why um, this co-occurrence of autism and gender diversity is the case. So um, a couple of years ago, it was uh, revealed by some autism researchers that um, gender diverse, so um, non-binary and transgender people are potentially three to six times, maybe more, um, more likely to be diagnosed with autism than cisgender people, so people who identify as the gender that they were assigned at birth. Um, and also that individuals with autism are more likely than individuals without autism to be gender diverse. So there's both things happening at once, which is um, a huge discovery and has really um, shaken up the field um, and dispelled this long-standing myth about autism as being the kind of the cis man's condition or disorder. And um, a lot of people have been trying to explain it um, to fit this old idea um, and in some varying and sometimes slightly not very nice ways, which I'll, I'll get into. Um, and so interestingly, trans men and assigned female at birth, non-binary people appear to be the most likely to be to have autism. And um, then it's followed by trans women and assigned male at birth, non-binary individuals, and then cis men and then cis women being the least likely. So that's the rough trend that we're seeing so far. Um, but the research is very much in its early stages. And um, everything I say could be proved completely wrong tomorrow. So that would be fun, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, it's quite exciting. Um, field to be working in. So I'm mostly going to talk about the first explanation um, that I talk about in my essay, um, which is the extreme male brain theory of autism and how that's been used to try and explain why trans men are so likely to be diagnosed with autism. Um, so I will try, oh is that letting me, there we go, I'll try and explain this um, in a way that makes sense. I could talk about it for hours. Um, so the extreme male brain theory of autism um, comes from Professor Sir Simon Baron Cohen, who's one of the leading figures in autism research and has been for um, 30 plus years now, I think, um, and has had a huge impact, positive and negative, um, on uh, the field and on the experiences of um, people with autism um, and that's um, one of his his main books that came out in 2012. Uh, so basically uh, his theory, the extreme male brain theory, holds that um, people with autism have an extreme version of the typical male brain um, and that's a very juicy sentence that we could unpack for hours as well. So he argues that there are essential uh, neurological differences between men and women, and he's just talking about cis men and women, he completely ignores people of other genders. Um, so he states that there is such a thing as a male brain and a female brain, based on the fact that, as he says, females in the general population on average have a stronger drive to empathize and males in the general population on average have a stronger drive to systematize. Um, so a male brain is systematizing or primed for systematizing and a female brain is primed for empathizing. And um, because people with autism, as he, he sort of found out and just argued but is, is being disputed um, because they have a, a below average 
levels of empathy and above average um, levels of systematizing, um, those with autism can be conceptualized as having <clears throat> an extreme version of the typical male brain because they're extra low on empathy, extra high on systematizing. Um, so this has been used to explain why trans men are so likely to be diagnosed with autism. Um, and the explanation goes roughly as follows. And just to be clear, um, Baron Cohen hasn't explicitly made this extension, but is aware of it and hasn't um, spoken about against it yet. Um, this is kind of the leading theory, trying to explain this co-occurrence. Um, the idea is that because of having autism and therefore supposedly having an extreme male brain, people who are assigned female at birth um, who have autism are very likely to identify as male later. And for a lot of writers on this topic, um, they've argued that uh, to the tune of um, there are women with autism who think that they are men because they have this extreme male brain. So um, that's problematic to say the least. Again, could go on about that for a long time. Um, so a recent paper has, has stated that um, transgender males score lower on measures of empathy than cisgender females. This hyper-masculine state may lead women with autism to feel separated from their traditional gender identity and may lead some women to develop gender dysphoria. So they're talking about people who present in these studies as trans men, as women who have gender dysphoria. And that's a very popular way to talk about trans people. Um, and it is, is not respecting the way that those people see themselves and, and wish to be talked about. So that's um, interesting in itself and um, continues to have a negative impact on trans people and trans people with autism. So there are approximately 8,000 problems that I find with this theory. I'll just try and briefly talk about some of them. Um, without taking up too much time. Sorry, I've probably already taken up too much time. Um, as I was just alluding to, it, it invalidates the, the realness of trans people's gender. And I mean, this theory um, arguably doesn't need to and shouldn't make any metaphysical or ontological commitments or arguments about how someone can have a certain gender. But it, it regardless of that, it goes against what these people who have actually experienced that gender and that neurodiverse condition, um, it goes against how they see themselves and therefore any experiential um, perspective and data from those people, which um, means it can't account for the, the people who it's attempting to account for. And um, these papers are not being written by people who have experienced this firsthand as well. So there's this, this mass kind of invalidation going on, which is having a negative impact, basically. Um, and I'll just briefly mention that there's a lot of science that's come out against um, Baron Cohen's findings um, about there being such a thing as a male brain and such a thing as a female brain. And um, the idea that there are these different levels of empathy in male and female brains. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave that there. There's lots of stuff you can look up about that later. Um, and then more pertinently uh, for my essay and for this talk, there's um, what I think is an unjustified and unhelpful essentialism about gender going on in Baron Cohen's argument and in the way that's been extended to talk about trans people. Um, so as you see in, in this book that there's a picture of the essential difference, essential is italicized, but in this book and in, in the work um, where beforehand where he talks about this essential difference, he never actually explains that or justifies it, despite it being the title of the book, which um, as a philosopher and the fellow philosophers here, that's a huge alarm bells and red flags are flying there because that's a very weighty word and a thing to say. And um, he genuinely, as Ruth Sample, um, a great writer has, has um, criticized, um, basically doesn't mention the word essential much again throughout the book um, and cites average differences between men and women, and cis men and women again, but just says men and women. Um, 
like what you'd find in, in a brain scan and in um, um, male and female typical behavior and doesn't explain how this then um, equates to an essential difference, essential to the brain and essential to those genders. So that's huge problems there. Um, and um, a really negative and huge impact that this has had is uh, the mass under diag under diagnosing of um, women with autism. So it's led to this conception of autism as a masculine condition, and therefore the um, like the questionnaires, the tests that you do to try and get a diagnosis for autism, are very skewed towards typical male behaviour. And there's um, as some of you might know that that people in the autism community um, kind of try and joke about this and make light of it, you know, that unless you're obsessed with trains and maths, then, you know, you're not going to get <laughs> um, diagnosed, uh, which is, you know, that's obviously oversimplifying, but yeah, that, that's a real problem. And, and luckily there's more research being done in that area. Um, but the stuff around trans people is, is lacking even more than that. So um, um, more problems briefly. Uh, the theory totally omits non-binary people, and as I said, non-binary people um, assigned female or assigned male at birth are more likely than cis men and women um, to be autistic, um, and they're just not mentioned in this theory. And the extreme male brain theory would have to say that um, non-binary people are necessarily more on the masculine side of things because they have this extreme male brain, but there's a plethora of non-binary people out there with autism, some of whom I know, who um, um, refute that with, with their existence and, and their existence and experiences are not uh, taken into account. Um, the theory also can't account for trans, the, the prevalence of trans women with autism without calling them anomalies basically because they kind of break break the theory um, it can't compute them um, so if assigned male at birth autistic people supposedly have this extreme male brain um, this should make them the most unlikely kind of person um, to be feminine to the point of transitioning um, or realizing that they are a woman um, because they've sort of got this double whammy if you like of, of maleness they've got the autism and they've um, been raised as um, a man, yet they are more likely than cis men and cis women to be diagnosed with autism. So that's a big problem for the theory and, and needs um, uh, a lot of work if, if it doesn't completely dismantle it totally, which maybe it should. Um, and then more specifically, philosophically, another problem that I talk about a lot in the essay, but I won't have time to talk about today, is the, the neurocentrism and internalism of this theory, this idea that autism is, is exclusively realized in the brain and it's a disorder of the brain, which ignores the relational and social and environmental realization and factors going on in um, the onset of autism, the diagnosis of autism and the ongoing experience of autism and of gender. So um, yeah, to talk more specifically about impact now, um, I wanted to talk about first, rather than the, the impact of my research, the impact that this research that I looked at has had and um, how I hope that will change over time. Um, so as I said, Simon Baron Cohen is, is like the biggest name in autism research, one of the most respected people. And this year he won an award um, in recognition for outstanding leadership of patient and people-based research, which um, you know, he has, he's, he's done a hell of a lot of good stuff um, for, for the field of autism, but this idea that it's people-based research um, really gets my hackles up because most of the people with autism as is now, has now been revealed um, are not included and are actively um, negatively impacted by his research so far. So that him getting that award um, doesn't sit very well with a lot of, um, autistic trans people um, I'm aware of as well. And work that criticizes his work and his colleagues work, such as Ruth Samples, which I mentioned earlier, um, inevitably has less of an impact than his and his colleagues. And it doesn't, 
isn't allowed to deflate the theory or kind of stand as equals at least with the theory as much as um, as much as it should, because there is kind of this hierarchy going on. Um, and Baron Cohen and his colleagues uh, last year, I think, um, have reported they are aware of this this prevalent co-occurrence and the statistics, and they've talked about it compassionately, but haven't um, challenged and developed their their old work accordingly yet, or really acknowledged the negative impact that um, that his and their work has had, and they haven't elevated the voices and the research, um, and therefore the impact of the research from those. The people who are progressing the field and the people who really have that first-hand experience of the things that um, uh, that um, I'm talking about. Um, more generally, in terms of impact, um, transgender experiences and perspectives uh, don't garner the philosophical attention and rigorous yet compassionate treatment that they deserve. And, and the same can be said for many mental conditions and cases of neurodiversity, such as autism. And I think it's safe to say that impact requires interest. And so if there is a lack of interest in the experiences and philosophical implications of the experiences of marginalized people, having an impact um, or diminishing the impact of, of the people at the top uh, is less likely it's hard to do um, and unfortunately many people don't care to hear from trans people and from people with autism about their experience of gender and autism and what it's really like um, and how they challenge pre-existing theories and um, the work which more accurately reflects their true experience is in danger of having a diminished impact and work that makes a lot of assumptions about their experiences has been having more impact. Um, many of the very few papers that were published at the time that I wrote this essay um, were written by cis people and too few included perspectives from trans people themselves and it was only really the non-academic pieces that were written by trans and non-binary people um, and really um, prioritised the voices of those people and so it, the academic community arguably typically is is, is slower at embracing and privileging those voices. Um, and I think that this, this needs to change. Um, and then in terms of my own research, um, well, first of all, it, it's still very much ongoing. Um, I'm hoping to do a PhD in this area and um, uh, try and develop this and develop a better theory um, with trans non-binary people, with people, um, um, with diagnoses of, of all sorts along the spectrum um, to have a more positive impact in, um, on these people and in this area. Um, so in terms of the impact of, of my research so far and my um, essay, which hasn't been published, but um, um, I think of it as having there's a small but meaningful impact versus this larger but only potential impact. So in terms of the small but meaningful impact, um, I have a couple of close non-binary friends with autism who read the essay and felt really seen and understood and encouraged. And that to me feels pretty huge, even though it's just two people, <laughs> um, but these are two people that um, don't often get to feel like that when, when they read particularly academic work that someone's actually um, represented them and um, saying the things that, that they would like to be saying and I, I'm hoping that in in my PhD I can really put their voices and other people's voices much more in the centre um, and have it yeah having a positive impact on them is is really important to me and hopefully counts as legitimate impact for for academic work to have um, and I think it's worth noting that um, I'm cis so as a cis person myself um, I think it's vital to gauge the, the real life perspectives of non-cis people on non-cis issues and uh, privilege their voices and where I can't um, advocate for those voices in my own voice. Um, and I think it's interesting and important to see um, what people on kind of the other spectrum of ideas and of, 
of just uh, people who are cisgendered see what impact this kind of work has on them and um, opening people's minds and maybe changing their mind even if it's just one at a time is is a nice impact to have better than better than none I suppose and then in terms of bigger impact um, the field's in, in its early stages as I said so it's hard to gauge what impact work like mine if it were to be published and other people's which I know is kind of in the works as well what impact that might have and but there's a good chance that it won't receive the attention and respect that it would arguably deserve because of this trend in um, not caring as much and um, promoting the work that it's challenging transphobic and, and quite traditional old-fashioned unhelpful views uh, but there's hope um, there's a growing number of articles and papers written about this issue and a growing number of people who are being made aware of the existence of trans people the existence of this co-occurrence and and some people who care about these people and care about those experiences um, you know, even five years ago, we were in a very different place in terms of gender diversity and neurodiversity. So in five more years, um, who knows? So there's hope that, that work like mine and other people's won't fly under the radar quite so much and maybe true progress will be made. Just be a bit cheesy at the end there. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>